Last time we were talking about uniform continuity. I want to say a little bit more about that this time and um, maybe go on to something else. I don't know if we uh, have time for that. Uh, I will refresh your memory about the definition and the theorem about not uniform con uh, about not being uniform and continuous. So uniform continuity is up here. It, um, this is about a function being continuous across an entire set where you can use the same delta uh, across the whole set. That's really the important uh, part of this definition. It says for any epsilon there exists a delta so that no matter what the points are, this uh, ordinary epsilon and delta relationship holds. No matter what the points are, right? The ordinary, the ordinary continuity allows the, um, the delta to depend on uh, what point you're looking at. But in uniform continuity, that's not allowed. It has to be satisfied at any points. And then, uh, so that, we did one example with the definition showing something is uniformly continuous, and typically it's not, it's not really very different from showing ordinary continuity using the epsilon delta proof. Um, and then we had this, I said at the very end last time, and we did not do an example, so I wanted to start off with an example of this. F is not uniformly continuous, is the opposite. And just like with ordinary continuity, the most uh, convenient way to show something's not continuous is by using sequences. And not uniformly continuous when there are sequences. This time you need two sequences, a sequence of x's and a sequence of y's. With xn minus yn goes to zero, basically this means that xn and yn are sort of approaching each other. Although they don't, it's not required that they converge. Like they might go, they might both go out to infinity, but in a way in which they're still getting closer to each other, that is allowed. Anyway, xn, um, this you should feel like xn gets close to yn, but f of xn does not get close to f of yn, which is what you should feel like. That's what continuity means anyway, all right? This, I want to say one thing about this right here. So this does not converge to zero. When you're talking about sequences, there are many ways that a sequence could fail to converge to zero. It could, like, um, it could go off to infinity, then certainly it doesn't converge to zero. Or it could approach some other number. Or it could, like, oscillate back and forth or something like that. Those, um, those are all examples of things which do not converge to zero. Now, in the case of functions, though, um, uh, it's certainly true that a function's individual values can oscillate, but it's not true that, like, all values of the function will oscillate between zero and something else. Uh, that, that won't happen with a function. So this right here, in the context of this theorem, um, this you can say equivalently, f of x n minus f of y n is greater than some, uh, I'll just say some c for some c greater than 0. This is a more technical way of saying this requirement right here. The fact that fn minus yn does not converge to 0, in this context, that's the same as just saying that um, f of xn and f of yn are greater than some specific number that's not 0, right? So like whatever that, whatever that thing is when you subtract them, you don't get zero, and in fact, well, if you're not going to get zero, you, you have to, all the values have to be bigger than something, all right? That's all I'm saying right there. Okay, uh, let's see if we can do an example of that, uh, showing that something is not uniformly continuous. Remember from last time, I tried to give you some kind of intuitive idea about uniform continuity, having something to do with the slopes, um, the fact that you need different deltas for every point is because the slope of the function is changing over, over the uh, domain. So this was an example we talked about last time, f of x equal x squared. Let's, uh, let's actually demonstrate this, uh, that um, f of x equal x squared is not uniformly continuous on R. Right? Remember, uniform continuity always involves some set. And um, I would like to show that x squared is not uniformly continuous on all of R. All right? 
And if you recall from last time, the reason you should believe that is because if you have your points um, going out to the right forever, the deltas will have to get increasingly small as you go out to the right. Um, all right, anyway, um, to show something is not uniformly continuous, I'm going to use that theorem up there about it um, not uniformly continuous requires that we have to think up uh, two sequences where those two sequences do approach each other, but when I plug them into the function, the, the function values do not approach each other. When I subtract them, I don't get zero. Uh, so we need two sequences. And this, you just have to invent on your own, although you should think about the function and ask yourself, like, what is it about this function which makes it not uniformly continuous? What I just said before was, if you let this point go out to the right, then you require smaller and smaller deltas. So about this function, I would say what makes it fail to be uniformly continuous is that you can uh, have values that go all the way out to the right. Um, would anyone like to suggest two sequences that I can use? I want two sequences which kind of approach each other, but when I plug them into the function, the function values do not approach each other. Any ideas? Maybe somebody give, give me one sequence that might be useful. Here's a hint. I'm not going to say 1 over n. That's because 1 over n, its values do like this, right? They approach zero, and around zero, nothing weird is going to happen because that's not that's not the issue when it comes to uniform continuity of this function. So, not one over n. That's like one of my favorite sequence, but not today. Any idea? Something else I could use? Yeah. Could just n work? Yeah. How about x n equals just n? I hope you have the, the vague idea that. Um, Instead of having these points approaching the origin, you want them to go all the way out to the right. Um, and I said before, it's not necessary that xn actually converges, because you might be worried like n, that n doesn't actually converge to anything. That's fine. Um, I have to choose the yn now to be another sequence, a different sequence, um, but such that the xn's and the yn's uh, Kind of get very close together as you go down the sequence. Um, in examples that we're going to do, it's not, uh, you can usually use, um, you don't have to have uh, too bright of an idea here. Can anybody just think of another sequence which also, um, well, it's also going to have to go out to infinity. You want another sequence which is different, but it approaches um, the values of the xn's when n is really big. What do you think? N squared, that's a, that's a good idea, although it's not going to work. Um, N squared, it's true that N and N squared both go, sort of go to infinity, but you need this to be true. Xn minus Yn has to go to zero, and that's not going to be true if you use N squared and N. They do not approach each other, right? N squared will be far away from N, uh, typically. So uh, any other idea? Yeah. N plus 1 over N. I like that idea. Now this still, like, you're not really thinking at this point about what the function is going to do to these things, but at least this is a good idea as far as something else which also goes out to the right forever, but it doesn't get far away from the, the first sequence that we said, Xn. All right? Okay, I like this. Let's just see. So what we need to do is verify these two things, right? We need to verify that Xn minus Yn does go to 0, and also f of xn minus f of yn does not go to zero. Let's see what happens. On a typical example, you know, you want to, uh, you might have to play around with these. Like maybe we'll check this and something will not quite work when then we go back and tweak the sequence a little bit to make it work. But well, let's see. So I got to do xn minus yn. What's that going to be? This is n minus n plus 1 over n. This is, I think, uh, just 1 over n, right? The n's cancel. I end up with absolute value minus 1 over n, so the absolute value can go away. And would you agree this does go to 0, right? 1 over n certainly does approach 0. What about the other one? 
f of xn minus f of yn. We want to show that this one does not go to zero. Well, all right. Uh, what are we going to uh, see on the inside there? f of xn. xn is n, and the f is squared. So this will say n squared. That's f of xn. I'm plugging in xn equal n. And then the f is uh, squared. And then f of yn will be n plus 1 over n squared. And I want to somehow, hopefully, show that that does not go to zero. What, uh, any suggestions? What can we do with that? Simplify. Simplify, yeah. How would you simplify? n plus 1 over n squared is n squared plus 1 over n squared plus 2. Yeah, we got we to gotta, um, like expand this thing. Do like the foil there, right? n squared on the front still. And then here you like n plus 1 over n, and then n plus 1 over n, right? So on the front, I get n squared. In the middle, I get 1 over n times n, which is 1. And the outside, I also get a 1, so that's going to be uh, plus 2 in the middle term. And then at the end, 1 over n squared. My goal is to show this does not go to 0, uh, but I, I think it's going to work out. The n squareds will cancel when you subtract. What remains is minus 2 minus 1 over n squared. And what does this converge to? I think it does converge, not to 0, though, right? Two. It goes to 2, doesn't it? The uh, 1 over n squared part will go away, and then we just have minus 2, but it's inside the absolute value, so this converges to 2. So can I just say does not converge to 0, right? That, that was what we had to demonstrate. It's not necessary that that thing converges at all, but certainly since it does converge to 2, it automatically cannot converge to 0. All right, excellent. So that means f of x equal x squared is not uniformly continuous. This is how we do it. You choose two different sequences. Now, in this case, our first choice worked, um, but I would just suggest here, depending on, like, once you try to work out the end, sometimes you'll realize your choice wasn't good enough or something. You need to change your sequence uh, a little bit. Uh, let me just say, you could also use, um, you know, n minus 1 over n, or maybe n plus 1 over n squared. Maybe just because of the details of the part that you do at the end, you need it to look slightly different. There are many, many choices you could have done. n plus could have also done like that. Sometimes that is a helpful little trick. You want to... Um, in, in whatever example you're looking at, you, might, you may have to change your strategy slightly just to make the details work out at the end. All right? But in this case, n plus 1 over n is good enough. Any questions about that? All right. Um, so it is not continuous on all of R. Remember, the reason, like, intuitively you should feel that way is because when you go out to the right forever, the slopes get increasingly uh, steeper. But it is continuous if you stop after a while. So I want to try uh, f of x equal x squared. It is uniformly continuous. That is what I meant to say a moment ago. On the interval, let's do, say, uh, 4 to 8. All right? So why you should feel that way is... What I mean is, you just, you only consider like right here from 4 to 8, right? Well, throughout that range, the slopes are increasing, but they don't increase forever, right? And you might say, as I move to the right, the delta I need gets smaller and smaller and smaller, but eventually get to the end, and you have some like smallest possible delta, but that delta, that smallest delta will should work for all of them, right? So... It turns out this one is going to be uniformly continuous only on the closed interval. It fails if you use all real numbers because the slopes can increase forever. But if you only go 4 to 8, they can't increase forever. They can increase, but only up to whatever you get over at 8, right? So let's see if we can do this. You don't actually have to think that through, really, uh, if you just need to do the proof. So I say let epsilon greater than 0 be given. 
and then we'll find delta greater than zero such that for all x and y in this interval, four to eight, we need x minus y less than delta implies f of x, that is to say x squared, minus f of y less than epsilon, right? So as always, we begin with f of x minus f of y. This is x squared minus y squared. I want to try to factor out of that, uh, somehow pull out uh, x minus y, and that is possible in, uh, in, in a, you know, this thing. Everybody knows x squared minus y squared can be factored as x plus y and x minus y, right? So I pull out x minus y, which I like. I pull out x plus y, which I don't really like, but we'll, we'll have to consider that. All right. Now, this is the part of the proof. If you were doing ordinary con continuity, I would start doing that thing about if delta is less than 1, yeah, that's usually what works. If delta is less than 1, then this part is going to be less than some specific number. Uh, actually, you don't have to say that in this example. I can just say immediately, uh, I'm going to replace this, this guy here, x plus y, with a specific number over there. Can anyone give me... Uh, there is a specific number you can say x plus y must always be less than some specific number in this example. Here is where we're going to use the fact that x and y are in this closed interval 4 to 8. So what's the biggest possible that x plus y could be? 4. 4? 16. 16? Yeah, I think 16. Yeah. No, it's not it's not because of the squaring. It's just uh, I have x plus y and x and y they both live in this interval here, right? So how big could it possibly be x plus y? Well the biggest possible would be if they were both eight and you get x plus y, which is uh, eight plus eight is sixteen, right? That that's the biggest possible value that this could have. Because x and y themselves are both uh, between four and eight. If you wanted to, you could think of this in even in. I mean, that I think it's not it's not so bad to just say sixteen there. But you could, if you like, write this in even more detail. You could do the triangle inequality, break that up into absolute value x plus absolute value y, and then on the interval, x and y are in the interval four to eight, and so each of those is let's wrinkle the eight, right? I'm just writing the same thing in two different ways: eight plus eight, which is sixteen x minus y times 16. So anyway, what's my delta going to be? It's going to be epsilon over 16 because I have x times x minus y times 16. So I let delta equal epsilon over 16 and then the whole uh, the whole end of the proof will work out. So I can say x squared minus y squared is equal to x minus y times x plus y but the x plus y is less than or equal to uh, 16. Uh, sorry, I left out some words. I, I should have said let delta be epsilon over 16. Then if x minus y less than delta, we have... Okay, anyway, um, this is times 16, but then this is less than or equal to, or straight up less than delta times 16, but delta equals epsilon over 16, so this is... That's it. Very standard, you know, epsilon delta style proof once you figure out the, the 16 part. All right. Any thoughts about that? Any questions from the folks back home? Actually, I don't know. I don't know if I have the sound on for the folks back home. So sorry. I could have been asking questions all along and I wouldn't have known. All right. Great. I got one for you all to try. And the folks back home can try too. Um, so this one, you you will want to think a little bit about the the uh, function. But the function is f of x equals one over x minus three. And your job is find a set A where f is uniformly continuous and prove it. 
then also find a set A where F is not uniformly continuous and prove it. All right. So you'll want to think probably about what the graph of this function looks like so that you will be able to choose those sets uh, in the appropriate way. And let me just say, be sure that A is a subset of the domain. Remember, x equals 3 is outside the domain of this function. So we don't even talk about whether it's continuous or not at 3. So whatever set you should, you're choosing should not use the number 3 in that set. All right, take a few moments, see what you think. I will zoom it out a little so you can see this. Well, you can see that is uniformly continuous part. How would you write it down? It's a little small. I drew a helpful graph of that function.
remove your set. Give me a few more minutes. I know uh, people haven't finished uh, both parts, but that's all right.
All right, I'm going to start writing down my answer to the first part, which most of you have been working on already. All right, let's talk about these. Um, it looks like people were doing great. I know I, I probably didn't give you enough time to do both parts, but um, that's fine. Um, that's fine with me, at least. So uh, for my first one, where it is uniformly continuous, really you could have chosen any closed interval that doesn't include the three. Um, I chose 7 to 15 just for fun. It really doesn't matter. Um, 7 to 15 on this picture would be something like there. A lot of people put, pick 4 to 8, which is just, I imagine, just because the same as what I used over here. There's no, nothing special about 4 to 8, although 4 is kind of special. You can't choose 3, right? It just has to be to the right of that, or it, in fact, it could have also been to the left of that, although as I was walking around, I saw nobody used to set on the left, um, but you could have if you wanted to. Anyway, what do I do from here? Uh, the... Um, the only way that I know of to uh, pull x minus y out of that is to make a common denominator and try to add the fractions together, which is a little nasty, but it's going to work. So you're going to get y minus 3 minus x minus 3 over the common denominator, x minus 3, y minus 3. And then up top, the 3s will cancel, and I get uh, maybe skipping a few algebra steps. In fact, uh, I'm going to write it this way. Y, come on now. Y minus 3, like so. All right. Okay. Um, and what do we do with this big fraction part there? Well, um, remember X and Y are in the interval. In my case, I use 7 to 15, which is not, none of you picked that interval. Um, but and I want to use a less than or equal, so I need to make the fraction as big as possible, which means I need to make the denominator as small as possible. So I'm going to plug in for x and y, both of them, I'm going to plug in 7. So in my case, I have x minus y times 1 over 7 minus 3, 7 minus 3, right? Those are each 4, and so I get x minus y times 1 over 16, all right? Now, you guys all used a di slightly different set, so you would have got a different constant right there. But anyway, the rest of my proof, I say let delta be epsilon over 16. And then, can I just say, et cetera? You all know how to finish the proof uh, from there. Are there any questions about that one? All right, this is where it is uniformly continuous. Um, remember, your sort of intuitive idea here is it is uniformly continuous over there because the slopes over this interval here don't go up to infinity, all right? Um, to make it not uniformly continuous, you want to consider where do the slopes go up to infinity, and that would be near the uh, near 3, right? So for the second part, for, so let's do the not uniformly continuous part. The set that you choose on which it is not uniformly continuous should be a set on which the slopes are increasing without bound, or a set on which the slopes are unbounded. Um, you should not be choosing some closed interval, like way off to the right, because actually the slopes are not very interesting off to the right. The slopes become interesting near the 3. So let's use uh, my set this time. Anybody work this one out? I know some of you did. What did you use? Sure, an open interval starting at 3 and going to, it doesn't matter, let's just say 4, say, right? Okay, great, that's a good idea. Um, 
I saw it just as I was going around, some people were being a little more exotic. You could have used something like, um, if you want your sequences to maybe go on, on both sides, you could use something like two to three, union three to four, right? This would allow you to, you know, the next step is you have to make two sequences with both, basically both of them approach three is what you want to uh, happen. If you use this one I drew in red, then you can use sequences on both sides, which makes the, the rest of the argument a little easier. Or I saw somebody, you want to go go all the way with this? You could just use R minus three, everything except three. Three, three is really the only point that, that you can't include. Yeah? Could you have made sequences too, or did you want like the sets? Uh, no. So your job in this case is, first of all, choose a set, and then you have to show that it's not uniformly continuous. Which and to do that, you got to choose the sequence. Just because I was doing it with sequences like x n and y n, that's why. But you wanted just like the sequ the sets kind of. Like no, you got to do both. Okay. So um, once you choose the set, you have to choose sequences in that set. Okay. Which I think is what you what yeah, you did. Yeah, I might just skip to that. No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Anyway, let's see if we can choose uh, in your set. You have to choose two sequences which approach each other, but for some reason when you plug them into the function, they do not approach zero. Uh, and depending on what set you chose, the allowable sequences you could have picked will be different. But um, since you gave me the set, did you, did you pick two sequences? I didn't get that. Uh, okay. Anybody use this set? Yeah. Uh, or, so I, I did three plus one over n for xn. Okay. Um, and then for yn, I did three minus one over n. Okay, yeah, this I think is the easiest solution. So this will work if you used, can I just say, if you use this set here, then this will be a will be great. Actually, I, either of these two will allow you to use these two sequences. What I said for A, actually you can't use that YN because this YN is outside of the set that I wrote as A, but maybe I'll just I'll just cross that out with blue for now. Let's use this as the A because it makes this will make the rest of the proof easier. Although I'll just, I'll say after we do this, I'll I'll tell you how you could have done it with the original A that I wrote there too. Um, all right, and then what do we have to do with the sequence? We have to plug them in. Or first of all, we need to verify that x n minus y n really does go to zero. Uh, what is that? It's three plus one over n minus minus 1 over n. Uh, when you simplify all of that, you get, I believe, 2 over n, right? The threes cancel, the other two will add up, and this does go to 0, right? And then what about, we've got to do the same thing for f of xn minus f of yn. This is going to be, so we need to plug into f. What is, um, what did you write, what did you get for f of xn? Uh, 1 over 3 plus 1 over n minus 3, and then yeah, right. minus the 1 over 3 minus 1 over n minus 3. Yep. So you plug each of those sequences into the function. The function is 1 over x minus 3, so you get these somewhat complicated things. Anyway, what does that all simplify to? All the 3's cancel. I end up with 1 over 1 over n minus 1 over minus 1 over n. And then you do the keep change flip or something. Does that sound familiar to anybody? One of my, um, I was talking to some calculus student about fractions inside of fractions, and they said, yeah, you just do keep change flip. I never heard of that before, but that's somehow some way of not like getting. When you're, you're multiplying them, you should use like, the top of the numerator, you keep, and then you change from dividing to multiplying. Uh, does that apply in this case? Yeah, but kind it's of? easy because it's all ones. You can just okay. Yeah. I don't know. I get n plus n, right? Yeah, just do it. If you're dividing two fractions. Well, if you're dividing two fractions, that's what it does. All right. And then you keep the first fraction. And then you oh, then you. Multiply the other one. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Somebody said that to me once, and I don't know what they're talking about. Just do it right. I don't. I don't care how you do it. Two n, right? And this does not go to zero. Okay, excellent. That's all we need. All right. 
So yeah, this is like this this bit about the sequences. That's the bulk of the problem. But the the point of uh, what I wanted you to try and focus on is like, uh, if you use a certain set, it is uniformly continuous. If, if you use some other set, it is not uniformly continuous. So um, I wanted you to be clear about what is the set each time. What if you had just used three four just um, just for fun on just three four? You could have used x n equal one over n, and you could have used y n. I believe if you use 2 over n, then this will work on that set. They're both on the same side. They both approach 3, but just because they are, they're different from each other, when you end up plugging them into the function, do the keep change flip, you end up getting something like um, n plus, I think when, when it's all played out, like this right here will instead say n minus uh, n over 2 or something like that. You play around with the, those things, and, and you can you can see how it plays out. So this works. Two, for uh, yeah, but this time they're both on the same side. All right. Any any thoughts about that? Excellent. We got five minutes left. Okay. Um, I wanted to. I had sort of a little proof to do, which I don't think we can do justice to in five minutes. But I'll I'll give you the idea here. Um, you will notice that, um, let me just say, it seems like if, uh, if f is continuous, I would like to know, like, if you have a continuous function, on what kind of sets is it going to be uniformly continuous? And on what kinds of sets is it not necessarily uniformly continuous? Like the example that, um, you know, Two examples, very simple examples that we've looked at have been like x squared, or maybe this function, x minus 3, uh, 1 over x minus 3. On what kinds of sets can they be uniformly continuous, and on what kinds of sets will they not be uniformly continuous? Now, um, on this example, this was not uniformly continuous on an interval like that. If I used an open interval, which has three as one of the endpoints, then it's not uniformly continuous. But it is uniformly continuous on a closed interval, where, of course, if I'm going to use a closed interval, I can't use three as one of the endpoints, because three is outside the domain. Um, but any in that example, any closed interval which excludes three, it will be uniformly continuous on. Um, and this one on the left over here, this was not uniformly continuous on the um, all of R, or can I just say anything like um, any interval that goes out to infinity? That was the problem for that first one, because when you go out to infinity, the slopes become infinite. Uh, but it is uniformly continuous on any kind of closed interval like that. All right. So there is a theme between these two examples about you remember the question I want to know is, on what kinds of sets will it automatically be uniformly continuous? Um, part of that answer is that it is continuous, uh, it is uniformly continuous on any closed interval, which includes, which is part of the domain, right? Of course, on the, on the one on the right, you can't use three as a closed interval, but that's because three is not in the domain. So it is a fact that a continuous function on a closed interval is always uniformly continuous. In fact, it's even better, and this will start off next time with this, if f is continuous, it's not just about closed intervals. On a compact set, k, then f is automatically uniformly continuous on k. All right. It is true for all closed intervals, but every closed interval is compact. And, and more generally, it is true for any compact set. It doesn't exactly have to be an interval. It just has to be compact. All right. The, uh, the, the proof of this is not very hard. I think we'll just start off with it next time, if that's all right. And I think that'll do for today.